before we get into the questions, I'm just going to start to my far left, and each of our panelists is going to give you a quick one minute who they are and what they do, and then we'll roll into the questions. So we'll start with Alexis. Sure. Hi, I am Alexis Posey. Uh, I am a senior analyst for health at the Federation of Protestant Welfare Agencies, newly titled FPWA, um, and a self-proclaimed HIV AIDS advocate. Um, and I used to work at the Drug Policy Alliance a long time ago, so shout to DPA. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Margulies. I am a civil rights lawyer, and I'm now, uh, in addition, an academic. I am a law professor and government professor at uh, Cornell in upstate New York. I'm Carl Lipscomb, and I work with the Black Alliance for Just Immigration, a racial justice and migrants' rights organization that organizes, advocates, and raises public awareness around issues affecting black immigrants and African Americans. I'm Kenyon Farrell. I am the... <laughs> Moving right along, um, Kenyon Farrell, I am uh, the U.S. and Global Health Policy Director for Treatment Action Group, or TAG. Um, uh, TAG is a uh, research and policy think tank that um, focuses on um, really pushing governments, pharma, um, other players uh, to uh, develop uh, better, affordable treatments and to create avenues of access for treatment for people with <coughs> HIV. Uh, TB and, and hepatitis as well. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jesse Daniels. I'm a professor of sociology at Hunter College, and I've spent uh, most of my adult life trying to dismantle systems of white supremacy. Okay, is everybody awake? Good. All right. So let's just start off with you, Ken, and you promised me no one will be asleep while you're talking. So, <laughs> so let's talk about this, I would like for you to comment, can everybody hear me? Please comment on how people have related to the HIV work that you have done when it was originally framed as a white gay disease. Sure, thank you. Um, so, you know, one of the things we kind of have this myth um, in this country about the, you know, kind of way, you know, the changing face of HIV. How many times have you seen that headline, you heard it, um, when the truth of the matter is, um, HIV was always from day one disproportionately impacting black and brown folks in this country from 1981 forward, right? The difference is, um, and in fact, when you look at in uh, June 7th MMWR, you know, CDC report that described the pneumonia, you know, uh, that was uh, appeared in, you know, seven uh, homosexuals, right, in a couple cities, Two of those men were black, right? But we imagine, right, that as white gay men, right? It was imagined as such, um, you know, pretty much from day one. And I think, um, you know, what has happened, um, you know, in terms of, I think, the, the course of the epidemic, um, we've had a, a kind of a couple different, you know, sort of issues in terms of um, how, how that particular framework has impacted um, you know, black and brown folks. And I think specifically talking about ways we can kind of trace the epidemic along the drug war and, um, and the ways in which HIV and just infectious disease is criminalized um, in different ways, um, I think kind of offers some, some similar, similar pieces. So, you know, one, in an earlier panel, you know, Bob Full of Love, who I love and is, I think, one of the people who really helped us um, over the course of the last 30 years really understand the kind of link between mass incarceration and um, the AIDS epidemic in the United States. And for reasons that are not for which we often hear, right? So oftentimes, the way we think about that link is, oh, well, you know, the men go to prison, and you know what they're doing in prison, and they bring in AIDS to their wives and girlfriends, and that's often the framework, right? When actually, it is the impact of mass incarceration that helped fuel the epidemic from day one. So think about it like this. We are in New York State, where 70% of uh, prisoners in New York State, also as, as Bob mentioned, um, come from seven neighborhoods in New York City. When you track the AIDS epidemic in New York City, it is almost those entire, those same seven um, neighborhoods. And so when you think about the, the numbers of people who are constantly moved in and out of a community, the ways that 
disrupts people's social networks, their sexual networks, their fam familial ties, and everything else, is a process through which infectious disease is going to spread. Right? And that is like the, the kind of linchpin to understand the drug war and, and HIV. Um, I'll say too quickly that, um, you know, right now in this, in this country where, you know, among uh, kind of AIDS activists, there is a, a kind of movement to, um, you know, ch challenge the different sort of laws that criminalize HIV transmission. And so if you're unaware, in about 32 states, there are specific laws that actually criminalize either the transmission of HIV or what some loose version of intent. And that includes everything from spitting, uh, you know, which is not a way you can actually transmit HIV, but that loss, those laws are still on the books, um, to actual um, sexual contact through which somebody contracts HIV, right? Um, so those, it, in the course of, of that movement right now, there is a sort of reformist movement that is often kind of talking about uh, modernizing the laws, right? Modernizing the laws based on what we already know, um, you know, in terms of people who are on treatment are, you know, um, almost, according to the research, have very little, if any, chance of transmitting the virus if people are what we call virally suppressed. Um, and we know that spitting does not transmit the virus, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, my problem with some of these frameworks, rather than thinking about a politics of, that's about repealing those laws and actually putting laws in place that prevent people from being, from district attorneys from being able to use somebody's HIV status as a way to criminalize um, them in any kind of court um, or criminal justice, criminal justice proceeding, um, that we need to, um, so what is happening right now is this, the conversation around sort of modernization, I think, is missing you know, what happens to a lot of black and brown folks in those processes. First of all, if, if we make the, the sort of bar whether or not somebody you know, is on treatment and virally suppressed, we know in this country that our folks are much less likely to have access to health care. Um, drugs are still unaffordable for people. But only about half of people in the United States who have HIV have access to treatment. Um, and those are mostly black and brown folks, right? And so if the barrier becomes whether or not one has access to treatment in order to avert a criminal court proceeding around uh, transmission, we're, our folks are still going to get locked up, right, period. That's number one. Kenyon, I'm going to need sure. to wrap it. Sure, wrap it. I know, okay. we're short on time. So, so let me just say this. Um, so I think in terms of um, the other thing that I think that we, we, we can't do, I think, and I think that is a, also kind of a lesson when we think about sort of drug policy and what's happening in terms of like marijuana, mar medical marijuana reform, and we're still seeing in states like Colorado, black folks still being criminalized for smoking outside, like there's black and brown folks are still the folks being targeted by police, even in a quote unquote legal state. Um, that we really, I think the one of the things that I'm trying to push in terms of the, the AIDS movement is that actually we need to go beyond the politics of like modernizing the laws and actually just repealing and making sure that people don't get criminalized because of their disease status, point blank period. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now, Carl, I was going to come to you, but I want to pose a question to Jesse first. Sure. So, Jesse, now, I. Oh, well, you're ready for this yes, one. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> in, in what ways has the white led feminist movement failed with respect to this issue? Great question. Um, I, is Jason Glenn back with us after lunch? Uh, uh, this brother earlier on the panel, uh, Jason Glenn, made a wonderful point about. Um, the uh, comments by the governor of Maine, who's talking about drug trafficking, and after these black and brown men come to Maine, then they, they get our women pregnant, right? And this, this narrative, right, which in some ways uh, harkens back a century or more in this country, uh, figures white women as the victims of black and brown men involved in uh, or caught up in the drug war, right? Um, and, and that particular narrative, I think, has been central um, in fueling the justification for the drug war. And uh, in general, the, the white-led feminist movement is completely absent from trying to intervene in this conversation, right? So there's a, a white-led feminist movement that's been very successful at, at advancing the cause of white women, like the Democratic nominee. Uh, but it has been absent 
it has been absent and in fact fueled uh, the mass incarceration of uh, black and brown, largely black and brown men in this country. And part of the way that it's done this, now this is one of those academic words, but I, I want you to remember this one, carceral feminism. It's this idea, right, that, that there's a version of feminism in which, the, in, in which imprisonment is the primary political project, right? So this was something that, that a white-led feminist movement fought for in the 60s and 70s was to, to get certain men locked up, right? And this has become a cornerstone, not only of white-led feminism, but of the war on drugs, right? We're gonna lock those people up, right? And that's been a, 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 a cornerstone of how, of how this uh, has worked. The other thing that I wanna say about the way that the white-led feminist uh, movement has has contributed to the war on drugs, and is that is through our popular culture products. Like, what's the shows that we're watching? I want you to, I'm not gonna ask for a show of hands, but I just want you to reflect on your Netflix queue or what it is you watch when you don't wanna pay attention very much, right? If you're one of those people, and I'll, I'll confess my own complicity in this, if you're one of those people who has watched Law and Order ever once, <laughs> We are complicit in a, a kind of popular culture that invites us uh, to identify with state-sponsored violence. And oftentimes, uh, we think we're being progressive when we see it's a white woman who is championing that state-sponsored violence. So I have lots of white women feminists that I talk to who are saying, but yeah, but SV SVU, that's helping because of, it expands our conversation of sexual violence, right? But it's still state-sponsored violence and it's white women who are leading that charge. So I'm just gonna stop there. Okay. <laughs> okay, Carl, no pressure. <laughs> How has this ph phenomenon played out in the immigration context? Yeah, thanks so much, and that's a great question. The way that it's played out is that the immigrants' rights movement is white. It's centered around whiteness. Um, in, in terms of the individuals that it seeks to serve, um, its ultimate goal of assimilation and citizenship, and its social structure, meaning that it reinforces white supremacy. Now, some of you are, might be thinking, what do I mean by that? Isn't that one of the few people of color-led movements in the country? Um, in actuality, that answer is no. Um, oftentimes when we, you know, we see immigrants portrayed in the media, when elected officials um, discuss immigrants, even amongst ourselves when we think of an immigrant, the face that we think of is a white face. It's a light-skinned Latino. It's rarely a brown person. It's not actually a brown person or a black person. And this narrative um, excludes not only immigrants from Africa, the Caribbean, Asia, but also Afro-Latino immigrants. Um, the way that this plays out is that resources um, for immigrants never actually go to black and brown communities. Um, they go to serve light-skinned or white immigrant communities. Um, when we hear folks talk about mobilizing the immigrant vote, they're not talking about mobilizing the vote of a darker skinned person. They're talking about mobilizing voter, Cuban, light skinned Cuban voters in Florida or, or elsewhere. Um, and then even social justice organizations, um, you know, either knowingly or unknowingly, tend to think of and develop programs and devote their resources to lighter skinned immigrants. Um, for example, labor unions. Many labor unions have their immigrant worker program and their black worker program um, without assuming that black workers can also be immigrants um, or uh, you know, Asian workers um, can also be immigrants. Um, so it plays out um, in that way. Um, in terms of the ultimate goal of the movement being whiteness, um, the one major mistake that the immigrants' rights movement has made is that it's never framed immigration as a racial justice issue. Um, for decades, the immigrants' rights movement has had this, you know, there are always talks about comprehensive immigration reform. And what they mean by that is making it easier for immigrants to assimilate into the US and to become citizens. In reality, when they say assimilate, they're not talking about assimilating into black America. They're talking about <laughs> assimilating into white America, into picket fences, into houses in the suburbs, um, et cetera. Um, because if they were talking about assimilating into black America, they'd recognize that citizenship is not a magic bullet that will get immigrants um, social justice in this country. 
um, black, black African Americans gained citizenship over 100 years ago. And for that same amount of time, they've been fighting to realize the, the full benefits of citizenship. Um, from Jim Crow laws, to fighting for voting rights, to today, to having to combat that state-sanctioned violence. Um, and uh, the immigrants' rights movement has actually failed to recognize the parallels within the immigration system. The parallels being that ICE conducting home raids is very similar to what, uh, what happened um, in the 1930s and 40s with Ku Klux Klan members um, going after black families. Um, and uh, you know, I think I know I, I don't have that much time left, but I think all of this just has really hurt the immigrants' rights movement. It served to divide African Americans and immigrants, African Americans who would normally be natural allies, but see the rhetoric of the movement as being a dog whistle against issues affecting African Americans. And the narrow goal of citizenship um, itself has been completely unsuccessful. Um, where the gains have been made have been on the state and local level um, and campaigns that have been led by actual brown and black immigrants. Um, so I'll leave it there because um, I know we have more questions later. Okay. Thank you. Okay, Alexa. <laughs> Here we go. Do you think the political, racial, and gender construction of the legislature influences the development of campaigns like messaging and spokespeople? Okay. Yeah, so uh, I'll start by saying that I was selected for this campaign because of my work on the Compassionate Care New York campaign, um, just, just for context. Um, and so that campaign was a, a project of the Drug Policy Alliance. Um, it still lives on, but I was a part of it from 2012 to 2014. So it's inception until the bill passed in 2014. Um, and so I would like to say that uh, Great campaign strategists probably do consider those things when creating a campaign, um, but hopefully don't center their campaign around <laughs> the, the makeup of the legislature. I do feel that Compassionate Care New York was um, somewhat centered around what the New York State legislative body looked like. Um, and so when you think of the New York State Assembly, um, it's majority Democrat, uh, very diverse, uh, a lot of representatives from downstate representing like communities like Brooklyn and so forth. Um, when you look at the Senate majority, it's white Republican, um, and that was our target. So when we started, we had already felt comfortable with where we were in the assembly and didn't really spend much time targeting those members or getting to work with them. Uh, we were very clear that we needed the Senate uh, Republicans. And so when Cassandra talked earlier about being in the Senate Republicans and meeting with them, it's not a game. Like it is all, you know, white men, uh, I think there are actually two white women on it now. Um, and they represent areas like Long Island. The, the heads of those areas, um, the majority are from Long Island. But like, not like Hempstead. It's like, you know, it's like Atlantic Beach, Long Island. And, you know, in Buffalo, it's like Tonawanda and Cheektowaga. So those areas that are like have really high white populations. And so the strategy of the campaign was to center patients and find patients who were in those specific target districts. So right there, you start off kind of already selecting who the patients are and what they're going to look like. So if I'm going to Atlantic Beach to find, you know, a patient who can speak to Dean Scalos, who's now in jail, um, <laughs> for corruption, um, you know, it's very clear who I'm looking for, right? And then also, I think the campaign strategy was built around sympathy. Right? And so it's not to take away from all the work that everyone put into it and the patient advocates, but it was built on you know, sympathizing with sick people. And so I think why we're all here and what we know is that there's just very little to no sympathy for black folks. So there was never, they were never gonna be you know, who we pushed forward in the campaign. And I don't always think that was intentional, but I do think we didn't give it the thought that it deserved. So I'm gonna ask, thank you. I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question on that and then I'm gonna come to you, Joe. What, if anything, would you do differently if you were tasked with that same responsibility today? Okay. Um, so I thought about this for a while, not like recently, but after the campaign had ended about like what could have gone differently um, in the campaign. Because when it ended, uh, it was a compromise bill, just so folks know. And um, although a few patients had access, it really um, 
didn't address the needs of like low-income communities, and this is not to say all you know people of color are low income, but it didn't address you know low-income communities within the legislation, and it also didn't do anything to address the communities that like are criminalized for marijuana use and you know in general, um, and who have a high rate of chronic illness actually. Um, so I don't know, right? So on the campaign we had a leadership team, and I always think about what our leadership team looked like. Our leadership team was built of the folks who could come and do the most, right? So like who could step up and say, I wanna smoke marijuana, I wanna give my child marijuana for their seizures. So the campaign kind of, you know, celebrated privilege in a way. <laughs> and so those folks were able to come in and they ended up being leaders and kind of making the decisions and being in the majority of the rooms and, you know, hearing more and kind of supporting whatever deals were being made. Like they were the ones we consulted first when we were hearing from the governor's office what was happening. Um, and so I don't know if maybe, maybe kind of bringing them in along the need for racial equity and kind of helping them understand what was happening, the current climate, if we didn't do a better job of that, we should have. Um, also at the same time where that campaign was running, the New York office had another campaign, which was the marijuana arrest campaign. And that campaign was solely focused on um, the marijuana arrests that were happening in New York and the decriminalization. And there was a choice to not connect those campaigns in any way and run them separately. And so for a campaign that was so heavily focused around race and the racial, like, racial injustice that was happening in one area, to keep it separate from that one kind of already made it clear that we would not be discussing race. And so I always wonder if maybe we started early on, um, you know, kind of connecting the campaigns and making that connection about the importance and you know, who's being criminalized for marijuana, if our leadership team would have understood it more, if the patients would have owned it more, because I mean, they pretty much at the end when we tried to introduce had already been clear on what they wanted to do and what they were there for and what they were fighting for. And their ownership of the campaign, I don't think included that lens, so. Interesting, thank you. Okay, Joe, I think everyone is, did you, anybody spot any snorers in the audience? Not anymore. No? Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, you found one, Joe? No, okay. I said not anymore. Oh, okay. <laughs> Now that we've called them out. Okay, so my question to you, Joe, is this. Um, criminal justice reform is taking place alongside two other transformative developments in American life today. One is gradual cultural and legal acceptance of homo and transsexuality. Same-sex marriage is legal and the movement for trans rights is already miles ahead of where we thought it would be two or three years ago. And the second is a gathering awareness of income inequality. So the question is, can criminal justice reformers learn from these other movements in a way that bears on black lives and white faces? Um, so um, the answer is I hope so, I believe so. Um, and the larger question, I think what, it, what, the, what the question gets to is this, whether we can expand the lens and uh, ally our interests, ally our efforts with um, other work that is being done. And in this, I build on what other people have said so far today about the idea of breaking down our silos. Uh, and I think there are a number of opportunities, and this is really sort of a segue to what I hope is the next set of meetings. I don't know if Professor Hansen is still here, but I really like what she said, uh, that this is really about uh, something more than simply drugs. Uh, it is about building a larger coalition uh, that addresses what uh, the demonization of drugs is, is symptomatic of. So in, in that respect, I guess I would, say, I would say this. There are two ways that I would suggest we broaden the lens beyond drugs to reach broader audiences and sweep in other social movement uh, networks. Um, one is to broaden it within criminal justice. So I've been shocked. I think this has been an extraordinarily uh, impressive um, uh, panel so far. I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Up until Ken used the word, there's been no discussion at all. The word has not been uttered of policing. Um, and you cannot discuss drugs unless you also discuss policing. For instance, early on, there was a conversation about the fact that overwhelmingly the number of people arrested 
uh, and charged with marijuana possession in New York and New York State are people of color um, or, 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 or get involved with marijuana offenses. Well, of course, that is an expression of a, um, the phenomenon of uh, allowing the police to stop someone as a discretionary judgment um, because they are, um, uh, they detect marijuana. Um, well, that's just an aspect or manifestation of saturation policing. It's because police are concentrated in one area that they come in contact with a person who they believe to be, and my friend from the Bronx Defenders knows this, they believe to be uh, holding or smoking weed. If you don't have saturation policing there, you don't have that overrepresentation. So there is an integral relationship between policing and policing of drugs. The second thing is in the relationship between violence. Um, the, this audience ought to know the New York State police, the New York State prison population is 74% people there on crimes of violence. I put it in air quotes because violence may not be what you and I conceptually think of as a, a violent act, but is a committed, committed as a, 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 it's classified as a crime of violence. Um, they are not drug crimes, but they are integrally cr cr connected to the use of drugs and substance abuse problems. So you have to expand the lens beyond just drugs to violence because of the imbrication and overlap. So that's expanding it within criminal justice. You can also expand it beyond criminal justice. Um, my work, uh, in addition to the criminal justice world, is in the post-9-11 world. I, since very soon after 9-11, I've been involved in post-9-11 civil rights work and was counsel in the first Guantanamo case in the Supreme Court, and today represent the man for whom the Bush administration wrote the torture memo, and who was tortured and is at Guantanamo, and was waterboarded and so on. Um, and, and before that, I did death penalty work uh, in the South. Um, and so I have seen demonization from a number of different perspectives. And I was struck by what Professor Martin said, that these are all just malleable demonization narratives that can be transferred and transposed onto different groups. And so whether it's Muslims who are demonized or guys on death row who are demonized, or um, uh, young men who are trans or gay or young women uh, who are demonized, the phenomenon is the same. Or if it's poor people who are demonized and we blame them for their own poverty and the inequality that uh, intensifies, the phenomenon is the same. It is uh, to isolate a small group who do not suffer that demonization put them safely within the magic circle and make them uh, uh, free from uh, the travails that come from a declining uh, capitalist democracy. And that is the found, that can be the foundation for a much broader coalition of interests that uh, transcends class and race um, and has an, uh, an alliance of, of movements that gets way beyond simply drugs. That is the ambition, I would say, is the ambition, because drugs are just a manifestation of a, a way to um, structure society so that some people stay on the bottom. Uh, that's the challenge. Whether we can achieve that is not self-evident. Well, thank you. OK, now we've heard from everybody. And I have a question. Since one of the concerns, the main concern here, is how do we win? All right? I mean, the goal here is not to lose at the end of the effort. Okay? Like a, a professor of mine once said, well, you know, Sophia, the struggle really is not for poverty. Okay? So <laughs> Alexa laid out a strategy that was very um, pointed at who is the audience, who are we trying to influence, or what are they likely to be moved by? Okay? And as I've heard each of you speak, you've raised questions as to whether or not that approach ends up benefiting the people who most suffer from whatever the issue is that we're addressing. And I think, Kenyon, that's where you let off. So I'm going to ask any one of my panelists to take a stab at what would be a better strategy in the arenas in which you work that would not leave 
black and brown people at the bottom after quote unquote victory has been declared. Gotcha. Can you want to take that on? Yeah, I'll start that. So right, we're, so a lot of the work, some of the work we're involved in, we're here in New York State, those of you may be aware that um, you know, Governor Cuomo kind of adopted this, uh, you know, end days 2020 um, strategy, which actually TAG was one of the kind of original sort of organizations that helped sort of move so that it became a statewide strategy. Um, and I think, um, and I'm actually really proud of it. I'm actually surprised some of the shit we put in it actually made it, <laughs> that it didn't get edited onto the floor because it read from the outside perspective as a very kind of biomedical strategy, just, you know, kind of access to treatment, access to pre-exposure prophylaxis, et cetera. Um, but it was far more comprehensive than that. I think one of the things that we have to do, and I think it, across issue areas is, so I, I agree with the position that you know, whatever you're looking at, that there is a way in which these, you know, kind of criminalization or these sort of, you know, kind of ideas of different groups of people, populations can be kind of transferred, where, so not just for uh, black folks, but onto non-black immigrants or onto poor people or et cetera. At the same time, we also can't lose sight of the fact that, like, black people still remain the perpetual, right? The perpetual sort of group that all of it gets sort of compared against, right? Or, or uh, and so, or, or still kind of remain the group that gets criminalized, even while other groups get targeted, moved in and out over periods of history, et cetera. So that, that's the piece that's hard, is like, how do we uh, sh uh, transform that sort of um, structure of real anti-black racism through which whatever we're talking about, black people still remain the sort of target of, even when other groups sort of come in and out of that, the target purview. That's a challenge. I think in terms of my own specific work, um, where we're talking about what kind of, I think HIV and even, even kind of hepatitis C or whatever, I think these issues of um, who sort of deserves, the sort of deserving groups are not as important. Um, and I think for specifically um, right now, a lot of the work kind of assumes that um, because we have access to, because you know, we're down to kind of one pill a day treatments for people with HIV or we now have a drug that people can take to prevent HIV, these things are, are moving, but we're still, they're moving still within racist systems, they're still moving within criminalized systems and impact how people can get it. And we're also dealing with, frankly, the, you know, again, the, the legacies of Tuskegee and, me and medical uh, uh, experimentation on black bodies. And I, I just wrote about this in our newsletter that just came out. We, if you think about it, so we, the Tuskegee syphilis study uh, was exposed and closed in 1972, right? That was only nine years before HIV entered our public consciousness. So is it any surprise that black folks I still come up against in Ubers and barbershops or whatever, like, don't you think that they got the cure name telling us or is man-made or the different kinds of conspiracy theories? And, I, and, I, and so for me, my, what I say to folks is like, well, I can point you to where the fucking racism is in the system. <laughs> that ain't it, right? But there's, there's racism in it, right? And so we can kind of break down and demystify. So I think some of the work that I'm interested in doing that I think will help us win in terms of really kind of ending the epidemic in a particular way. Like the, the piece around medical mistrust is a huge gap. There's no organizing around it in this country. There's, there's very few activism right now around medical and healthcare issues, period, for black people, right? And I think that we have to, in our kind of conversations about Black Lives Matter, and I don't think this is the fault of the organizers, I'm not saying that, but I think that we can't kind of uh, assume or, or kind of only get mobilized you know, within a certain kind of construct of, of, of black mortality and black premature death. So we have to be mobilized, not just at when it's the end of the barrel of a police gun, but the person, the 26-year-old uh, who I just buried from AIDS in Harlem a month ago, mm -hmm. right? And, okay. and until we start to be able to mobilize around those kinds of um, premature deaths of black life, we can't transform the the cages and the police. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Jesse, you wanted to take a stab at this about strategy and how do we make sure that black and brown faces aren't left at the bottom of the barrel after all the strategic work? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, uh, Deborah Small at the panel earlier was saying we, we have to sort of think about systems of, you know, what reproduces 
white male supremacy? What what are those systems? And and the the kind of um, uh, feminism that I I grew up as an adult. I didn't know about feminism as a kid, but uh, that I grew up with as an adult was was all about sort of analyzing, you know, white male power. And, but the question that I've come to later in my life is is who are those women that those men are married to, right? Mm -hmm. And, and how are they supporting this system? And how is that connected to um, the system of white supremacy of a century ago, of two centuries ago, of three centuries ago, right? How are those uh, white women in positions of power, though it may be a relative or relational power to the white men, how are they contributing to these systems, right? There was a documentary, I was trying to look up the name of it, I can't remember the name of it, but it was a documentary about um, uh, schools that came out uh, a couple of years ago, and there's a wonderful interview, I'll, I'll put it on the Twitter hashtag later, there's a wonderful interview in that documentary of a, of a white woman who is married to a guy that runs one of these private prison corporations. And she said, my, my husband is in the business of uh, f keeping these beds filled, right? And she said, and the part of the way that they do that is they check the failure rate in predominantly black schools in third or fourth grade, right? To, to know who's gonna fill those beds later on. She knows that and she said, you know, admirably to her credit, says, I want you to put my husband out of business. But the fact is that woman is still dining out at four star restaurants, is still staying in the best hotels, right? And was impeccably dressed for this interview, right? Right, and there, I think there is a whole strata of white women who have these kinds of positions of power in society that could be a lever, right, to change the system, right? Have you looked at who runs publishing, yeah. right? These are white women who are creating these narratives in large measure, right, in complicity with this white male supremacist patriarchal system, right? And at the same time, championing feminism, <laughs> saying we're equal now. Well, who are you equal with? You're equal with a white male power structure that is churning black and brown bodies. And so I think for me, part of what was so compelling about what Alexis was saying earlier about who is sympathetic, that this is really the sort of uh, crucial part of the, the white woman narrative in, in this culture, right, is because white women are are the sympathetic ones, right? That's the, st what do you think runs Lifetime Channel, right? Those are stories of white women, right? And, you know, to, to Joe's point about demonization narratives, I absolutely think that we've gotta, we've gotta be able to uh, upend those. But, but I would just suggest that in some ways, white women in this society are inoculated. We're never the demons. Right? It's, it's part of why those true crime movies work, is because, oh, she killed her husband, look at that. He must have deserved killing, right? I mean, there's a, there's a way in which white women don't, uh, are, are inured from, are prevented from becoming those demons. And I think that we've got to challenge that. We've got to challenge that hegemony of this kind of white-led feminism that has failed us and, and made us blind to our own, um, our own captivity, as Deb Small was saying earlier. Wow. Well, I have to say, Jess, you gave me a perfect segue into my next question. So on November 8th, <laughs> something big is supposed to happen in America. Tell, tell the truth. <laughs> so rumor has it that there's going to be an election for the President of the United States. And I got it on good authority that Ms. Clinton is going to win. And that my esteemed panelists are going to be part of her cabinet <laughs> as to how to address the drug war in the United States and bring it to a screeching halt. And she's appointed Alexa to head that effort with the brilliant assistance of Joe, Carl, Kenyon, and Jesse. All right, now. let's do it. No pressure. I know everybody's awake now for this answer, right? So to my panelists, and we'll start with you, Carl, since Alexis called you up and said, I sure did. You gotta, you gotta help me with this one, okay. 
So <laughs> what would you, esteemed cabinet members, advise our new head of the country as far as how we should bring the drug war to a screeching halt and make sure that black and brown people are not left still at the, back, at the bottom of the barrel. Go for it, Carl. Decriminalize. Decrim decriminalize uh, drug offenses and not just drug offenses. Um, you know, uh, any, you know, any offense that victimizes black and brown communities um, I'd advise her to divest from policing and to develop programs that encourage states to divest from policing um, and to invest in programs that produce real public safety, such as harm reduction services, jobs, education, et cetera. Um, and I'd advise her to appoint more people um, like us to her administration, um, grassroots people that um, either work with those that are directly impacted or who have been directly impacted themselves. Do okay. I hired him? That's, that's <laughs> how, how's that sound, Alexa? <laughs> how, that sounds great. Good yes. job. We're glad you're on the team. <laughs> yes. Okay, so now, Alexa, you've gotten this advice from, from Carl, and then you turn to Joe, who says, How did we end up with this president in the first place? But we want to try to do the best that we can. Right, Joe? Under the circumstances. And you're going to give Alexa some additional advice that you think will move this effort forward. What would you say? Well, um, I agree with Carl. Those are, those are important first steps. Um, but there's others. Um, we know that the, the federal government uh, can have an extraordinary, can have an overlarge influence on state criminal justice practices through what they uh, incentivize and to what they fund, right? So the burn grants uh, and the, the incentivization of um, civil forfeiture uh, and the misuse of that as a way to fund um, uh, local operations and the you know, local municipal police departments and the rise of SWAT um, was the, in, in large part, the consequence of deliberate federal policy and DOJ policy that incentivize certain programs over others. So you can have uh, an extraordinary influence through the power of the purse, uh, through what DOJ uh, funds and what it prioritizes and incentives it creates for the federal government. That can be leveraged also through partnerships, public-private partnerships to, for instance, uh, keep people out of jail. What we've known forever in the criminal justice world is the people who are in pending trial tend to stay in, and the people who are out pending trial tend to stay out. So empty the jails as best you can. Uh, so there are concrete steps that you can take um, regarding, regarding incentives uh, that with the power of the federal government's dollar. Uh, the other thing I would say, though, is that decriminalization um, is important, but it doesn't reach the non-drug offense, right? What about the guy who uses drugs and who, who, who has a substance abuse problem and then robs a liquor store, right? The decriminalization is not going to reach that. So you need to reach that through other interventions. And, th and that is a much larger, in terms of the number of people sent to prison, that's a much larger percentage of the population. So you got to reach those guys through treatment and intervention uh, at, at a very, very early age. So decriminalization alone will not solve the nexus between drug, uh, uh, drug abuse and, and, and addiction and um, uh, other related crime. That's the intervention that needs to take place. OK. Mm -hmm. Well, President Hillary is, is enthralled with this idea. <laughs> and she says, OK, empty the jails, empty the prisons, um, black and brown folks in charge. <laughs> um, but she asked Alexa, um, Alexa, we need some input from Jesse since she's been taking on white male supremacy. And you know who's running Congress. <laughs> And we got some issues there. And I don't have much time. I might be a one-term president. So 
how, what am I going to do? And can you get Jesse's input on how quickly can we shift things in Congress to make what Joe has suggested a reality? Oh, you just gave me the easy question, right? How do we shift things in Congress? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have a solution for Congress. I, I, do, th I do think that what, what we're not talking about that we do need to talk about um, is, is what we're going to do with, these, with people that if we, if we close the prisons and we close the jails, what we're going to do with folks, right? Because one of the, some of the research that Robert Fully Love, who was here earlier, has done uh, indicates that housing is really one of the biggest issues that uh, predicts whether or not people will um, be reincarcerated or not. And, and some of the research that I've done indicates, indicates the same. So I think that we've, we've got to have I mean, really what we have to do is we need a social safety net. We need, we, need, we need a comprehensive housing program where housing is a human right, the way that we began to talk about health as a human right. We need um, a comprehensive jobs program where jobs are, are, are guaranteed income, whichever you think might get through Congress easier, um, is, a, is, a, is a human right. Um, and, and treatment, if for people who want treatment, right? I don't think we should mandate treatment. Uh, if people want to use drugs, they should be able to use drugs, right? Um, but I think that if for people who want treatment um, and need it, that that should be free. So h how are we going to do that with a Congress we have? I don't know that we can, but I think that, um, you know, if, if we uh, move together in, in rooms like this and in, and in bigger arenas, I think that we can begin to shift the conversation so that we can even begin to have conversations about what the important issues are rather than having the narrative hijacked by, pardon the expression, uh, by people like Bill O'Reilly who wants to want us to go back and debate whether slavery was morally evil or not, right? I mean, that's, uh, and that's the con kind of tactic that we see on the right wing, right? Sort of shifting the conversation so that we're constantly um, knock back on our heels, uh, rather than having conversations about reparations and jobs programs, instead what we're doing is talking about slavery and um, civil rights from a decade ago or, or a century ago, right? Okay, we've gotten some really sage advice, Alexis. Really sage advice, and I, you have a few minutes before your meeting with the president. Uh, you've gotten input from all your cabinet members except for Mr. Yeah. Farrell. Yeah. And <laughs> What's the one question you would put to Mr. Farrell quickly before you run in to advise the president as to exactly how we're going to bring this drug war to an end and stop this war on people, particularly black and brown people? Sure. So I would need you to tell me what we need to do right, in regards to health and you know drug policy. And then I would want you to make a really big pitch for like reparations, right? <laughs> <laughs> to you to be like, pay us like you owe us, like seriously, really quickly, OK? Yeah. And we gotta make got sure it. she's not late for this meeting. Team. Right, sure, gotcha. <laughs> so, um, get rid of insurance companies. We need single payer universal coverage. <laughs> First of all, um, we also need to support paying for actual health outcomes and not just what treatment you get, which is but people get, you know, things that they don't actually need or aren't beneficial, but just because a drug company advertises a drug, that is what people end up wanting which means that we don't, we get rid of those damn commercials on television. <laughs> um, also, obviously, government control, drug costs. Um, and I say these things because there is actual evidence that having access to health care, even for people who commit various acts of harm, actually reduces, quote unquote, recidivism and those kinds of things, right? So actually, providing for comprehensive health care matters. Um, I would also say, you know, kind of government back in the development of treatment, of, of development of, 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 of um, you know, different kinds of uh, treatment for illnesses, um, and that they keep control, though, that they um, keep those patents and don't turn them over to pharma, which is what happens, which is why a hep C cure, which was actually developed with, with our taxpayer money, went to Gilead and now costs $100,000 a cure, for which people in prison who need it the most are not getting. That's it. Yep. All right, I think, Alexa, you'll be on time. What's the, what are you going to tell the uh, voting public here in the audience that you will be taking to President Clinton um, um, in a minute? 
I'm still trying to figure out how I ended up in the Clinton administration, so that's one. Uh, <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and your fellow panelists are all trying to figure out how yeah, they ended up in the Clinton okay. So that's yeah. one. I'm then going to tell you that I have an amazing team, so thank you all. <laughs> um, and I think I'm just going to take uh, what I heard from everyone, right? I'm going to talk about decriminalization. I'm going to talk about the health system. I'm going to talk about all the things that were shared here today. And then I am going to make my final pitch, as my policy bestie told me to, <laughs> for reparations. So, <laughs> and I'm going to tell you this is what she needs to do. She needs to make sure, just tying it into the theme of why we're here today, she needs to invest in the communities that have been destroyed by the war on drugs. And I think we will see a shift. You do? I do. From the Clinton administration. <laughs> I can hope, context, right? I'm, I'm working right. for her, so I have to have some sort of faith in right, her, actually, right? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> But I'm we still said, questioning how I ended up here. <laughs> Can I just add one thing? We, we said it was going to be a one-term presidency. Right. So <laughs> Jesse has something to say to make sure it's a one-term presidency. Yeah, yeah. yeah. this will uh, cinch the deal. Right? <laughs> Michelle Obama, you Michelle. mean. Hey! <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> So I, I, I think this has kind of been implied in some of the things that we've been saying, but I just want to be explicit that I think part of what needs to happen is that we defund police departments, yes. not just demilitarize them, but that we defund them, that it may, they're out doing bake sales, um, <laughs> and that we disband organizations like the DEA and the ATF, mm -hmm. uh, right, as part of this. Um, that's, that's my two cents. Yeah. That's a one term um, president. Alexa, I am certain that you won't hold this post position long yeah. <laughs> after you uh, present it, but I would suggest that you go for it, and maybe our <laughs> audience will uh, speak with their voting feet and make sure that maybe it's not a one-term presidency after you've gotten an opportunity to share the sage advice with uh, <laughs> the new president-elect. So I'm going to ask the audience to first to give my panelists a round of applause. And since you want to make sure that they stay in the cabinet, what are the questions you want to put to them? No, we have some time for Q&A. Where's our roving microphone people? Why are you getting over there? Did they do a good job or did they do a good job? Thank you. Y'all awake? OK. Oh, by the way, before you give anybody the microphone, I just have to share with everybody, this is the question and answer period. This is not the speech addendum period. <laughs> so questions end with a question mark. Right. Okay. So go for it. Thank you so much. This was really, really a great panel, very brave panel. So I wanted to ask about um, where we were starting to go, Joe, with policing. And some of us have been talking about one of the ways to de-incentivize police violence would be to um, build some kind of popular movement that instead of having tax levy dollars go to pay families of those who are victims of police violence, that those monies would come out of police pension funds. I just wonder what you think about that, if there's credibility in that, if that's something to push. Look, I'm all in favor of changing incentives. I and mean, the fact is uh, organizations respond to incentives. Um, you know, I teach criminal procedure, and so I talk to my students about the exclusionary rule. People may know the exclusionary rule is, you know, if you, if you violate the Fourth Amendment, the evidence doesn't come in. Okay. Well, that's not a meaningful incentive that doesn't have any effect at all. If you violate the Constitution, you're, you lose a week's pay. That has, <laughs> bam, they stop the illegal searches. So people respond and organizations respond to incentives. Um, and you can structure incentives that have more or lesser effect. Um, I would say that police violence, though, is derivative of a, a larger problem. Again, you have to look at the larger problem. And the larger problem is the perspective that is held by many police departments, but not all. We should acknowledge that there are some good police departments in the country, and there are some good police training that's going on in the country. Um, uh, it is driven by the belief that the people where the police are concentrating are, uh, are monsters. And, uh, and the folks who are the subject of saturation policing are themselves the problem, uh, not part of the solution. That perspective 
uh, stokes the tensions you need to soothe and inevitably produces the kind of friction that will, in some predictable fraction of cases, lead to an explosion of violence. Um, and, and that can be addressed. That can be changed. It's not as though we don't know how to do it. It's been successfully done in some jurisdictions that used to be beset by the most riven, divisive, uh, tension-rich problems are, are now better police departments and better police community relationships. It can happen, and it's not, so I wouldn't focus just on um, violence, which is the last expression of a long simmering problem. I would focus on why that pot started to boil, which could have started years ago, and then in fact, invariably started years ago. Uh, I'll make it quick. Uh, mine is a two-part question, but uh, specifically, can we, how can we incorporate e economic arguments into some of these narratives? And second, uh, what role do educational institutions have in educating the public, or at least challenging the status quo? Because I think part of the problem is the media propagating one narrative that over time we all seem to accept or acknowledge without finding a way to challenge that narrative either through education or class. A uh, very specific example, I, whoa, whoa, I just- whoa, whoa. I don't hear a question mark at, at I just read that example. some <laughs> prisoners are being restricted <laughs> from reading specific books. Uh, so I think that's a general problem that the education system could help alleviate. He sneaked that in there. Okay. <laughs> Anybody on the panel here want to take on that question? Okay, Jesse. Yeah, I, th uh, I think it's two, uh, two questions that you asked there. One is how do we get economic arguments into um, into these into these discussions? And I think that um, you know I'm trained as a sociologist, and there's one um, theoretical tradition in sociology that that compels us to always ask who benefits. And I think that just asking that question, who is benefiting here, who's making money off of the situation, is a really compelling way to get that into um, these discussions. And then, you know, I'm a college professor, so what am I going to say? I think education is real important um, to, uh, uh, to bringing people into a discussion about how to be critical of media narratives, how to be critical of political narratives. Um, we just uh, read there were two um, recent cases where, um, oh, I'm going to forget them, so I'm just going to stop there. Um, college education, most important determinant uh, after race of who's voting um, for the various candidates in the coming election. So, super important. Can I just mention one? Yeah. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Please, no, go ahead. Carl, you want to add something? And yeah, I just seven wanted... Seven minutes. I just wanted to add, I slightly disagree in that I think that um, uh, I value educational in institutions, I value education and whatnot, but I think that education, uh, oftentimes when we start you know, thinking theoretically, when we only engage those that have access to a university education, really we're talking to the privileged few, and we're not necessarily talking to those that are directly impacted. So I mean, I think that, you know, I think while it's, it's, it's good to engage academia, I think, uh, I don't think that's the problem. I don't think that's what's lacking. I think what's lacking is that we haven't been able to change the broader narrative that the average person um, walking down the street hears. Okay, there's one more question back here Yeah, as well. I think I see three questions. Four, <laughs> so why don't we do this? Because I'm very mindful of the time and I don't, I don't want to, compromise the next panel. Why don't we get all four questions stated and then the panelists can take a stab at them, okay? okay. Go ahead. Please articulate your questions yes, succinctly. Uh, hello. Um, do you really think that we can uh, abolish the 13th Amendment without abolishing capitalism? Okay. <laughs> ah. And so that is a thought-provoking question, but may be much broader than the topic of today's panel, but we'll put it out there. Where's the next question? Hi, mm -hmm. Deborah. I just wanted to um, follow up on the point that was made about ACT UP 
and how it relates to the issue of drug policy. Um, first of all, to remind people that ACT UP stood for AIDS Coalition to Unleash Power. I think unleashing power of drug users Deborah, is Deborah, I'm important. gonna, and I, you know I love you, but you question. gotta pose a question. Here's my question. <laughs> right now, there's a HIV epidemic going on in places like Indiana, which is the state that the current vice presidential candidate is coming from. It's a place where there's a general rejection of needle exchange. I think that we should actually sue the government and hold them accountable for people's infection in the knowledge of the fact that we could do something to prevent this. That instead of just having um, defensive work, that we should I'm actually I'm looking for your proactive. question, Mark Deborah. So what can we do proactively to hold the government accountable for helping people get sick? when they know what to do better. Okay, I got that question. All right, next, thank you. Hi, uh, Matt Curtis from Vocal. Uh, very as succinctly as possible. Yes. What do you think of the prospect uh, that of we cannot have a durable solution to this problem and this project of uh, ending the drug war in a way that is just for people that have been most impacted by the drug war without making a much deeper commitment as a movement to investing in community organizing? Okay. That's a thought-provoking question. There's some, there's more thought-provoking questions <laughs> percolating in the room. Let's get them all on the table. Panelists, are you, you listening up? My question is accountability. Accountability. When are we going to throw bad cops in jail for killing people, and will this reduce the problems that we're having with people getting murdered in the streets? Okay. Thank you. That's another thought-provoking question. Here we go. Hi, uh, my question is really succinctly is about healing, right? I'm a psychologist and uh, prison reform's great, educational equity, health equity is all good. But how do we go about, and none of that can take root, I think, um, without healing first. And so that's my question is, what do you guys think about how we go about getting this stuff actually done in a way that helps the people who most need it? Okay, thank you. And I think there's a couple more hands over here. Um, I'll try to keep it very brief. Uh, usually at, at the last panel we, we broke before lunch, uh, one of the gentlemen talked about when we seek reparative justice for black people or uh, you know, Latino or brown folks that have been harmed, usually it all, well in my, from what I've seen it always, <laughs> goes back to helping white folks and they get most of the aid. So what can we do to combat that as we, you know, seek re uh, reparative justice for black and brown folks? How, would you, how could we not have that outcome again and again? Okay, thank you. I think that's one of the central themes for t this panel. And there's another thought-provoking question. I can tell it's thought-provoking <laughs> from here. It's actually a few, so whichever you get to. The first one is I didn't hear anyone mention, um, like in the scenario of being in Clinton's cabinet, about holding her accountable for her support of her husband's crime bill in 1994. So I'd really like to hear if anyone would be interested in doing that. And second, to I what- I knew it was gonna be thought provoking. Go ahead, what's the next one? <laughs> right, and second, um, to what extent, um, you know, if, if we could map out a little bit the capacity of the federal government um, to address some of these drug policy questions when a lot of them are at the level of states and municipal governments. Um, and then the other one, very not related, you but I'm very three interested. three questions? Sorry, this is for we Carl. We have two minutes. Okay, fine, for Carl, I just wanted to hear a little bit more about how your drug, about how your work with immigrants is related to drug policy. All right, thank you. We've got all the thought thought provocation we can handle. All right. So we have two minutes. We're going to do like speed dating. Um, we're gonna start with Alexis. You can, all right, we're not gonna start with Alexis. She, she just had like a heart breakdown. Okay. We're gonna start with Jesse. Okay. And you can take any one of those questions if you like. And you have 30 seconds to hit and quit. Uh, absolutely. It bees that way sometimes. 
<laughs> let me <laughs> let me let me hit Hillary because uh, that is a white woman that needs to be held to some accountability for uh, for her rhetoric, for her actions, uh, uh, for the harm that she has created in communities of color. Uh, and we can start with the 1994 crime bill if we want, or we can go back earlier than that. But I think that uh, part of the reason that Hillary Clinton skates is because she's a white woman, and we never see them as demons. Thank you. All righty. So, can you? You got 30 sure. seconds. Hit gotcha. it quick. So, to the question, um, Deborah, about um, Indiana, I, I think it, we, it has to go before and beyond that. It's a similar situation where we're paying attention to what happened in rural Indiana and not paying attention to what the fuck happened to Gary, Indiana, right, around HIV or anything else. And so to me, I think, yes, we need syringe exchange and whatnot. We need those things in place. But I think we need to go um, to thinking uh, much more comprehensively about like not just holding the governor accountable, but just even but public health, CDC, down to local health departments, account and and, me and medical in, um, institutions for um, and, and healthcare, all the and insurance, all these institutions, the medical industrial complex, if you will, um, for their seconds. lack of focus on um, poor people, people living with HIV, drug users, etc. Okay, Carl. Cool. Um, I'm going to try to take two. So when we think about reparative justice, I think we have to think about it from an intersectional lens. We should center black people, trans, queer folks, etc. But part of the strongest argument is that when we center those folks, everyone will benefit, including white people. Second, uh, most immigrants are criminalized um, because of drug offenses. When we hear Trump and folks talk about criminal immigrants, most of those folks they're talking about deporting are convicted of very minor drug offenses. Okay, thank you. Okay, 30 seconds. Um, I want to try to link the idea of accountability <laughs> with community organizing. Um, the lesson of um, litigation as a social movement tool is abundantly clear. Litigation, and I say this as someone who's been a civil rights lawyer for three decades, litigation by itself will never, ever work. It always has to be paired with aggressive, broad, widespread community organizing from the bottom up. Don't, don't rely on the lawyer going into court. That will not be the solution. Spoken like a true lawyer. All right, Alexa, you, last word goes to you as the head of this cabinet. Okay, so uh, I guess I'll address the healing part, right? So I'm not necessarily sure what that would look like, but you know, I hear the word atonement come up often throughout this whole thing, and I remember, I believe Deborah talked about an apology, right? And maybe that's the starting point, right? Like apologizing and then addressing the trauma that's been inflicted on dozens of hundreds of thousands of people around what's taken place. And I don't know what exactly how we move into a real healing model, but I think that is the starting point, so. Okay, let's give it up for this panel. <laughs> you did a great job. And for our moderator. Yay, Sophie.